It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the intractable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? Fantastic. It's a gorgeous day out, and uh, I'm excited to talk so- some more about the Bard from Avon today. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. It's a beautiful day. It's like in the 70s in the New York suburbs. It's not humid. In fact, it was, it was so cool last night. The temperature went down into the 40s, believe it or not, by dawn. I was tempted to put the heat on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I thought so, it was a gorgeous yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah, I just you know, just huddled under the covers. That's all, and slept. It's good sleeping weather. So I'm very, I'm, I'm a happy man, and very happy to be continuing our discussion of the, the, the man who I think is legitimately considered the greatest dramatist in world literature, and on anybody's short list of one of the greatest poets, the Bard, the great man, William Shakespeare, the man who is not of an age but for all time, as Ben Johnson said about him. So. Shall we pick up with that great quote from King Lear? Absolutely. Right, right. Um, Lear, Lear is a brutal, I mean, tragedy. It's just, you see the Royal Shakespeare do a, a good production of it, and it, it just kicks your guts out. It's so powerful. It may be Shakespeare's finest tragedy, but anyhow, uh, great. some great lines in there, some immortal lines from King Lear. And one of them that I o- always loved is, is goodness and wisdom to the vile seem vile. Well, that, I mean, think about that for, for a minute. Simple, but, you know, when, when I, so, so I just give an example. I've, you know, I've lectured for I don't know how many colleges and universities over the years for the Ayn Rand Institute on capitalism. And, and sometimes, you know, the leftists, they're, they, you know, they're, they're like, they're, they're uncivilized. They yell, they scream, they interrupt the talk, you know? And uh, it, I just remind myself, well, you know, goodness and wisdom to the vile seem vile. These, these people hate individual rights. They, they hate capitalism. They're in favor of some kind of authoritarian regime. Today, they're racists as, uh, as, as can be. So I just remind myself of you know, that, that great quote from Shakespeare. If, you, you, if you're presenting goodness and wisdom, then people who are evil are going to respond in this very, very negative way. They're going to hate it. It reminds me, it's a really nice encapsulation of a point that Aristotle makes in his Nicomachean Ethics, where he's talking about uh, virtue being a mean between two extremes, deficiency or excess. And there's a lot of qualifications to add in there. I mean, you you can't just, as many do, say that virtue is a golden mean or something. Those weren't even in his words. Yeah, Cicero Cicero used the term golden mean. mm -hmm. But, But Aristotle said that you know, for instance, for uh, for the virtue of courage, the, the person who is rash, who rushes into war uh, without good reason or not under the, the right circumstances, well, to him, the courageous person seems like a sissy. And to the sissy, the courageous person seems rash. So what'd yeah. you say? Wisdom to the vile seems vile? Yeah. Goodness and wisdom to the vile seem vile. Right. You know, and, and I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking it's, it's, it's such a simple formulation. How come I didn't think of that? And, 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 it, and then, you know, I realized, well, when some literary genius puts it in those words, it, it seems simple. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a complex thought. The, the, the evil will respond to goodness with, with outrage. I mean, if you stand up and defend individual rights, John, to the Nazis... You know, they're going to kill you. <laughs> so Yeah, this reminds me of a, a really amazing point that Lisa Van Dam made in her talk, uh, Enrich Your Life with Poetry from Toscon 2019. And she's talking about poetry, and we're, we're going to talk about some poetry today too, but mm-hmm. I think this point is applicable to literature more broadly. It's that when you find these, uh, these ways that literary geniuses have put things They've encapsulated a thought that you might experience in your own life. You might know someone who, who will experience that in your own life. And they do it in such a way that it enables you to see more deeply and to become a more perceptive, thoughtful, uh, artful person. Mm-hmm. And so you know, when we can grasp onto 
phrases like this and and use them in our own lives they really do help us to uh to to just better understand the world right pithy and trenchant you know this is what literary geniuses can do uh it reminds me of that great line from tolstoy who i can't say i actually like tolstoy's writings i mean he's very mystical and he's and he's you know profoundly altruistic. Uh, by the way, uh, you said was talking about literary geniuses. Uh, I, I got to confess, I was never able to get through War and Peace. I tried it like three or four times at different points in my life. I was never able to read it. And yet, Tolstoy is a great writer. There's no doubt about it. Master and Man, literarily, is a brilliant story. You want to see the essence of self-sacrifice, an advocacy of self-sacrifice presented in a literary form? I, I, I hate it. I think it's, you know, it's evil but it's literarily, literarily brilliant. So, you know, give Tolstoy his due. But anyhow, my point here is he's got, he's got a great line that uh, you, may, you may have, quote from Tolstoy, you may have no interest in evil, but evil has an interest in you. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. I think, I, I think of that a lot when, when, when I'm discussing politics, you know, and standing up for freedom because I, I don't really love politics. I, I love literature, philosophy, and history. I know politics is part of philosophy, but it's not my favorite part. But, you know, I, I'm, I paraphrase Tolstoy. You may have no interest in politicians, but politicians have an interest in you. <laughs> so, so, you know, you get these trenchant insights brilliantly put from a literary genius, and it's, uh, it is. It's, it's, it's instructive. Um, all right. Oh, oh, by the way, you know, we... we quoted Ben Jonson a number of times, who was a great poet himself. And when, when, you, when he said Shakespeare was not of an age before all time, again, I mean, it's put so artfully, it's so, it's so concise, it's so succinct, it's so accurate, and, uh, and, and, and a legitimate, uh, true, accurate testament to the greatness of the bard. Should we uh, King read Lear. some? You've got a, a beautiful quote for us, I know. Well, well, I have a, I have a whole bunch of stuff from from uh, Shakespeare, but uh, this is, we we didn't touch on on Shakespeare's sonnets yet. Mm -hmm. So should we should we read should we read some of his sonnets? Absolutely. What's your favorite? Well, you know, the sonnet eighteen. The let, let, let's start with that because you know when we um, did did a episode on. The heroic romance of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett, which I love. I mean, I, I love those two. I, you know, I love. It is heroic. Uh, I love romance. Uh, I, I'm half in love with Elizabeth Barrett myself. You know, <laughs> but, but um, um, you know, her, her famous sonnet. How do how do I love thee? I forget what number it is now. But how do I love thee? Let, let me count the ways. I mean. People who don't know the first thing about poetry very often, you know, know those lines. And uh, Sonnet 18 from Shakespeare, I think, is very similar. By the way, Robert Browning considered, I think legitimately, one of the two or three greatest poets of 19th century uh, British lit, uh, considered his wife's sonnets the greatest, uh, the greatest sonnets in any language since Shakespeare. A little biased, but yeah. Yeah, he may not be the most objective good. observer here, but, yeah, but he's uh, still... Her poetry was excellent, and uh, her love poetry was excellent. And Browning uh, is right that that's outstanding. But since Shakespeare, maybe, maybe not. But his uh, his uh, very famous uh, sonnet eighteen from from Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shade the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot. The eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair, of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. You think Shakespeare had a high opinion of himself, John? <laughs> <laughs> He's saying, I eternalized you in this poem, my love. You better appreciate it. 
<laughs> One of the ones I want to read has a similar a similar <laughs> message at the end. Well, let's let, let's hold off on that for a second and yeah. just look at look. You know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day again? You know, it's it's like trite by now, but when Shakespeare wrote it, four hundred and, and and some odd years ago. It was fresh and new. It's a tr it seems trite only because it's been, you know, it's been stated over and over again so many, so many times. Uh, what, what else in, in here? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Yeah, there's, there's some, um, so, there's, there's some beautiful, some beautiful lines in, in here. Sometimes too hot, the eye of heaven shines. That's for sure. So, somebody doesn't like hot, humid weather. That, that's me, but yeah, that's a, a great, a great ending here. Uh, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. <laughs> that's good. That's well, I don't know who, nobody knows who Shakespeare wrote these sonnets to, or if, if he just wrote them to some fictional, you know, some, some imaginary person. But we know, we do know that there's beautiful love poetry. Absolutely. Um, so there's one I'd like to read that, you know, we, we talked a minute ago about how great art can really encapsulate an experience that you have and help you to experience that even more deeply and to appreciate it even more. And this, this past winter, after months of just very little interaction with friends and family, COVID lockdowns here in Massachusetts, plus the, the short, cold winter days that we have, I was feeling pretty down. And a friend of mine, Keith Sanders, was actually recording some poetry and putting music to it. And he asked me to, to read a poem. So I looked and I tried to find something that spoke to me. And I came across Shakespeare's Sonnet 73. And it really put into language far more beautiful than I could write what I was feeling at that time. And it gave me this new sort of depth of perspective that I didn't have before that. So I want to read it. But then I also want to, want to translate. Because one of the things that I learned from Lisa Van Damme's talk, which we'll link in the show notes, uh, Enrich Your Life with Poetry, is that poetry, the value of poetry is extremely dense and it's not easy at all to access. It requires doing a lot of work to get that value. So sitting down with a dictionary, looking up unfamiliar words, translating the poem into your own prose to really get at its meaning, and then reading it aloud to, to grasp, as Alexander Pope put it, how the sound echoes the sense of the poem. Mm -hmm. So this is Sonnet 73, and again, this really captured how I was feeling this past winter in, in words much more beautiful than I could put it. Oh, let me grab it. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang, upon these boughs which shake upon the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire, that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as, death, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong, to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. Hmm. What is he saying here? So I, I did my own translation of this, which I'll read, and, um, and perhaps you'll have uh, s some other interpretations on some of this stuff, but I think it's pretty accurate. So it's that time of year when the leaves, except for a few yellow ones, have fallen off the trees. The bare branches shake in the cold winds. The birds used to sing there, but now these choirs are ruined, the, the, the trees. Mm -hmm. You can see in me the, the same twilight that you'd see on the eve of that kind of dreary day. And you can see in me the sun fading in the west, in the night that soon swallows up that fading light, 
leaving a kind of death wherein everything is at rest. You can see in me the kind of fire that has burned through its youth and now is mere ash putting itself out. You can see all of this in me and the thought that my life will soon be up, that I will see you no more, makes my love all the stronger. And I love this beneficent twist at the end because we get all this tragic imagery about the bare trees and the wind and the birds are long gone. And, the, you know, the light of life is fading. The, the fire is being consumed mm -hmm. by its own ash. But it is that finitude of life that makes it so special. And we cherish it more the less time we have. And I, I love that thought. Uh, you know, it's just a gorgeous poem. But um, so much of it is so down. But then we get this beautiful twist at the end. Well, John, that's a. I think I think your interpretation is exactly right, and and your your prose there itself was very beautiful. It's very very clear and beautiful exposition on on your part. So I want I want to thank you for that, uh, my my soul brother. Thank my, you, my literary soul brother. That was excellent. I think the bard would be proud of you know your exposition there. <laughs> I won't go that far, but no, I uh, think he would. I, I mean, a, a writer. Especially one as profound as Shakespeare is, uh, I, I assume you know, he's writing primarily for himself. You know, as, uh, like Howard Rourke says in the Fountainhead, you know, to 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 you know to uh, you need to love the doing to excel at something. You need to love the doing. I, so I assume Shakespeare is writing primarily because he he loves it. But still, uh, you you write a masterpiece. You want other human beings to be able to appreciate it. And I think he would. I think he would definitely. Uh, uh, enjoy and you know and be proud of approve the the way you just interpreted his poem. Yeah, and, and it's really just meant as an example of something that I'd encourage people to do. It's something I learned, as I said, from Lisa Van Dam. Uh, if you if you can translate the poem into prose, I mean, just in doing that, I thought I already understood the poem. But then when I when I sat down to to translate it and put it into my own words. There were things that I realized that I had been misinterpreting. And now that I had to slow down and really think about each word, oh, wow, that unlocked some new doors for me and, and made it all the more impactful. And that's, I think, poetry takes that work. And if you're willing to do it, you can gain massive, massive value from it. Right, right. And poetry is, is as, as we've been doing here, I think it's meant to be read aloud Absolutely. because it's music. You know, poetry is music in, in literature. It's music in words. And you, you read it aloud, and you know, like we we ended last week's show with that great speech from Henry V. You know this, you know this ode to courage. And you read it aloud, you just go, "Wow, wow, it's so powerful." And, and as I was saying, we we just kind of gush over Shakespeare. You know, even though you know in many of his works, I don't agree with his philosophy, but he just. He's just this literary master. He finds the right words, the right thoughts and the right words over and over and over again. It's just extraordinary, extraordinary how he does that. Well, uh, back, to the, back to the dramas, back to the plays. I've got one more sonnet, if you don't oh, mind. No, no, go um, ahead. I love, I love, like I said, I love, love poetry, so, so go ahead. This is, yeah, this is a bit more of a love poem, and this is the one that ends with a, a similar uh, thought to the one that you just read, Sonnet 18. This is Sonnet 78. So oft have I invoked thee for my muse, and found such fair assistance in my verse, as every alien pen hath got my use, and under thee their posy disperse. Thine eyes that taught the dumb on high to sing, and heavy ignorance aloft to fly have added feathers to the learned wings, and given grace a double majesty. Yet be most proud of that which I compile, whose influence is thine and born of thee. In others' works thou dost but mend the style, and arts with thy sweet graces graced be. But thou art all my art, and dost advance as high as learning my rude ignorance. What is he saying? So I, I did a quick translation of this one as well. Um, so I'll read that. So, so oft have I invoked thee for my muse and found such fair assistance in my verse. I'm sorry, I'm reading the poem. I wrote about you so often. This is, this is the, the translation. I wrote about you so often and you always buoy my poetry, making it so beautiful that other authors steal my imagery, dispersing your beauty throughout their poetry. 
Your eyes are so wondrous, they make even the dumb and sullen sing and highly pitched at that, making them more educated, teaching even the intelligent to be more so, and the graceful to be still more graceful. But please, be proudest of what I write, because you are my inspiration. When others copy me and write of you, it only mends their style, raising their art to a higher level. But you are my sole muse and inspiration, lifting me from rude ignorance to the heights of intelligence. Wow. If that was, if this was uh, a real life person, then, you know, we, we don't, we don't know at, or even what gender, uh, you know, the, the person was, if the, if there was such a person, but anyway, that person should be very proud of uh, Shakespeare saying this about him or her. Yeah. And he asks for that pride, which I thought was kind of funny. So when other, uh, when he says, but p please be proudest of what I write is my translation of the way that he put it. Um, yet be most proud that, that of that, which I compile. Well, he said these other guys, you know, mm -hmm. copying me, these, 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 these pikers, these amateurs, you know, they're, they're copying me. So, uh, yeah. but, but, but you know, in effect, you know, I'm, I'm the fresh original here. Yeah. I'm the OG. That's right. That's right. Well, I think uh, you know, this is you know at, at the at the conclusion of, of of today's show, John. I have another great martial uh, uh, passage to read from Henry V. Henry V is good. If anybody if anybody wants to, to you use the, the term buoy just before, if anybody wants to buoy their courage, you could you could go through Henry V and and uh, you know and, and find some some great passages. But it's 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 interesting and I think it's often been remarked uh, it, by, by Shakespeare's plays. Uh, he wrote so many of them and so many of them are, are outstanding. His comedies, his tragedies, his histories that you know, the philosophy often expressed in the histories is different from the philosophy expressed in the, in the tragedies. You know, the, the tragedies, the you know, you know to, in order to be tragedies, have this sense of be, you know, human beings be, being doomed. Whereas the histories are, are often heroic and, and triumphant. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different vision of, uh, of, of human life that, 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 sh that Shakespeare presents. Um, I think I do. I think we discussed last time the what I thought was was let's repeat it briefly because I think it's a it's an important point. You know the the essence of in his tragedies the essence of his 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 tragic vision. You know that you can see it in Hamlet where you know Hamlet just thinks and thinks and thinks he doesn't do. He's got he's got the evidence necessary. The 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 ghost is taken seriously in in, in that historic context and he knows. From his encounter with the ghost, what's happened and, and, and what must be done for many reasons. But he he's, keeps looking for more evidence. He's thinking about it, he's thinking about it. He doesn't take action until it's too late. And you know, I, I think a good way to put it is you know, para paralysis by analysis. And and Hamlet was a brilliant philosophy student at Wittenberg, and Shakespeare is showing us, well, you know, reasoning is uh, just it, it, the, the reasoning doesn't goad us into action. And so it's 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 it, you know there's there's time we, there's times we need to take action and 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 thinking about it isn't isn't the the way to go. The philosophy is like a paralyzing field. What a, what a contrast to John Galt and Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. That, you know, that would be a that would make a a great lecture or even a great course <laughs> in a, in a literature uh, philosophy course. You know, analyzing the the com comparing and contrasting the different visions of reason and the role of reason in human life in in, in Hamlet and and an Atlas shrug. That would be a that would be an excellent, you know, an, an excellent discussion. But then in the, in the other Shakespearean tragedies, you 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 see you know human beings acting on you know on various impulses, whether it's you know power lost in Macbeth or jealousy in Othello or you know gullibility and vanity and Lear. And you see, well, you know, if if we act on our emotions, we're blind. We're acting blindly, and it leads us to to doom. But if we're men of reason, then we don't act at all, and it leads to our doom. We go, well, what, what else is there? Reason paralyzes us. Emotions lead us into blind destruction. And yeah, I'll, I'll, there's there's this the deeper philosophic point I think of of, of Shakespeare's uh, tragic vision. Can't agree with him, 
about his 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 um, his uh, uh, analysis his, uh, of the nature of reason in Hamlet. But wow, does he express it? You know, in in, in brilliant you know literary form. And to be fair, you know, Shakespeare was doing this as his his income, his means of making a living, and to some extent, I think he needed to appeal to the customs of the day. Uh, he obviously surpassed those. But I'm not sure, and I don't think anyone can, really can be sure, of what Shakespeare's true philosophy was, because it's not definitively apparent, at least to me, that what he was doing was attempting to portray a philosophy. It seems as though what he was t attempting to do is make a living and, and entertain people, and he certainly did that. And um, it'd be interesting to know, but we know so little about Shakespeare the man. Uh, there are just so few historical records. But yes, I think, you know, at some level, we have to say, okay, well, given what he's given us, what, what is his, his philosophy? And uh, there is a huge contrast between, you know, the, the tragedies, Romeo and Juliet, or one I want to talk about, one I read in high school, I don't know why, Titus Andronicus, probably one of the darkest, definitely, I think, the darkest Shakespearean play. And it's it's fascinating. I mean, yeah, I don't know Titus Andronicus, so I'll just listen to you when when you discuss it. But there's no doubt that Shakespeare was a crowd pleaser. You know, there's 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 no doubt the the, the you know his 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 a lot of his plays are filled with sex and violence. You, you know, uh, and bawdy references. Uh, you know, and Hamlet's talking to Ophelia about lying between a maid's legs. You know. And uh, you know the 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 double the double entendre there you know and the and when when he when he tells her because he thinks she's been unfaithful right and he's he says to get thee to a nunnery you know to a nunnery go get you know get get thy ways to a nunnery go nunnery you know what is that and you know people read it today they think he's telling her to go to a convent uh, but nunnery in Elizabethan England English meant brothel and so but either way you interpret it it makes sense. Yeah, you know, the double. Didn't know that. Yeah, the double meaning is the, that the, the double entendre that Shakespeare is often able to bring into his his dramas is just beautiful because it, either way it, it, he could be saying to look if if you're unfaithful if you can't be faithful in a romantic relationship then don't have one go be be a nun and go live in a convent or you know if you're unfaithful you know you can't be faithful to one man then you know go you know be a prostitute you know in in a, in, in a brothel either way it makes sense in. Uh, in the in the context, so yeah, Shakespeare was a crowd pleaser. There's no doubt about it. He was making he was he was he was making money, and yeah, yeah, the Elizabethan audience was was rude and crude, rude, crude, and socially unacceptable. And in order to make money, to you know, you had to uh, placate the mob with a you know not the mob but the crowd, you know, with a great deal of of, of sexual references and violence and stuff. What's amazing is Shakespeare just just raised this. To this exalted artistic level, while while he was giving the crowd, he was giving the crowd what it what it wanted, so he could be successful and make money. But doing so at this very this this ennobled you know uh, literary level, it's, it's that's really been been reached by very few authors in in all of history. Yeah, when I was learning about Shakespeare in high school, uh, one of the points that my teacher made that I remember very little of, uh, but w one of the points that I do remember was that Shakespeare wrote such that any, anyone on any level can come to it and they'll get out of it what they bring to it. And this is, you know, this is the same with many types of, of art, but Shakespeare could do it and actually entertain all types of people at the same time and, and give everybody what they, they were coming there for. Um, right. You right. mentioned the nunnery thing, and that, that also reminds me of something uh, that I used in high school, which was the Shakespeare glossary. And I think it's the author's name was Onions, and there's a Shakespeare glossary. So if you're serious about getting a lot of value out of, out of reading Shakespeare, if you want to go do it and, and dive into his works, you can get, um, I've got the complete works of William Shakespeare. You can get it in a single volume like this, and then you get the Onions glossary and you're set. I mean, there are obviously tons of other books you could get, but those two will get you started. Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's unfortunate Shakespeare like a lot of things in our schools is 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 often poorly taught you know as, as if he was this because he's at such a high level 
uh, like, like he was this, you know, this prissy kind of writer who's, who's writing only for, for those with aristocratic sensibilities. <laughs> yeah, nothing, nothing could be further from, from the truth. Shakespeare's a blood and guts, you know, sex, sex and violence kind of, kind of writer. But yes, he does raise that to this extraordinarily high level. And I got to give credit to one of my college professors who was, because I went to a Catholic school, John, and everybody, so so you know, when, and I was an English major. So one of my professors was a was a nun, Sister Marie Krantz, and uh, she loved Shakespeare, and she you know she understood Shakespeare. So it was it was interesting being in class with a nun as the as the professor, uh, who was a very good natured human being. You know, uh, the best of Christianity. You know, Christianity at its best. You love God and you be kind to your brothers and sisters. That's you know it's a very benign view of what you know, of what religion is. That was you know Sister Marie and she. Uh, we we're talking of blood and guts and we're making all these sexual references. It was it was but, but you know Sister Marie understood that she appreciated Shakespeare the way Shakespeare should be appreciated. So it was really it was it was excellent. Alack, alack, at least we die with harness on our back. You know, in, in, <laughs> in, in Macbeth, we go through all this blood and guts kind of stuff. <laughs> Macduff comes in at the end with the, the dripping, the blood dripping, holding the tyrant's head by the hair, the blood dripping off, off the neck. You know, this, uh, this, is, this, this is just you know, powerful imagery, powerful stuff. Or die, die, Lavinia, and thy shame with thee, and with thy shame thy father's sorrow die from Titus. Well, go ahead. Tell us about Titus Andronicus, because I don't know. I know very little about that play. Ah, okay. Well, <laughs> it's if Shakespeare ever wrote a horror story or a Halloween special, this is it. Uh, I read it in high school, and I was just amazed by the brutality of it. And I'm still not sure why this is the one that my teacher chose. But there is just so much bloodshed and gore; it's nonstop. One reviewer actually calculated and, and figured out that there's a major act of violence every 97 lines. So if you're going to go read this play, just wow, keep this wow. in mind. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Should make it into a movie. People, you know, today, I mean, people love that, that stuff. That stuff sells. Lots of you know, these these action films, so, sometimes there's so much violence. Every, every you know, a, a, a new fight scene, you know, to the death every 97 seconds. So it's, yeah, this uh, could easily make yeah. a, a modern day remake like they did with the, the Romeo and Juliet version. Um, or I think there actually was a, a more historically periodic uh, movie made of it, but I haven't seen it. So but today, well, yeah, a good remake. Today, you you could get The Rock, you know, and Jason <laughs> Statham, you know, you can make you can make this into a that, real, yeah. can make this into a real brutal action movie. So, but what's the plot? What's what's the story about? Sure. So Titus Andronicus is a Roman general, and he's just returned from ten years at war, and he had twenty sons, of which 16, twenty sons, twenty sons, with one which, with one wife. Or how many? How many wives? Uh, I don't know. We I just feel for the. Out. I feel for the poor girl if she had, had to have twenty oh kids, and, and yeah, also just the boys. Know. Maybe she had. Maybe she had some girls also. But but but, but I interrupt. Go ahead. But so he lost sixteen of them at war, oh, God. and he's captured Tamora, the queen of the Goths, who they were fighting, and uh, her three sons, and so he decides to sacrifice, as was the custom, her eldest son to his dead sons which earns him, of course, her undying hatred. But when they come back, she's actually made empress by the emperor Saturninus. And she frames two of Titus's sons for the murder of the emperor's brother. So two of his sons, two of his remaining four sons are then executed. Um, unsated, though, she convinces her two remaining sons to rape Titus's daughter, after which they cut off her, her hands and tongue and oh Titus's surviving son, Lucius, is then banished to Rome. He seeks an alliance with the Goths. Uh, Titus seems to start going mad, but he actually isn't. He, he's just feigning it. He tricks Tamora. Uh, he kills her two sons, and this is the best part. This is the only Shakespearean play that I know that has cannibalism in it. Uh, he bakes a pie with their corpses and feeds it to her. After oh, my which God. There is a uh, bunch uh, more killing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is this is gruesome stuff. Wow! And it's, you know what's incredible is that Shakespeare wrote this play. It's uh, it's dated typically to 1594, which is the same year he wrote Romeo and Juliet. 
So this just goes oh. to show you his incredible versatility. He's writing this one of the the, the you know most heart wrenching tragedies, love stories of all time, and this like basically Hollywood gore fest movie uh, in the same year. It's just that is the wow. I mean, I'm I'm impressed. Yeah, I, I wonder. Um, you know, just to bring this to real life for a second, they they the stories from under these communist regimes in in, in Bulgaria, the the secret police, the the Dijab, the Siganost, what the the Bulgarian KGB was supposed to be even more brutal than the KGB. There's there's stories that they you know that they uh, you know uh, in, in the concentration camps in the gulags, you know where they 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 would beat uh, these dissidents to to death. With their fists, the secret police would beat them to death with the with their fists, feed them to the pigs, and then kill the pigs and and feed the pigs to the dissidents' family members. And after the family members eat it, they tell them that, that well, you just ate, you know, you just ate your 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 son or your brother or you know or, or your wife or, or whatever. Ugh. Supposedly they did that in real life. So I wonder if they had Your read. You know, I wonder if they had read Titus Andronicus, you know, and, and got the got the inspiration from that. Very possible, yeah, yeah. Because it'd be interesting because uh, it, it's really strange. But the communists often educated the elite, at least you know their, their top students, better than better than we educate you know many many uh, many of our kids. So uh, maybe they, they might have been reading Shakespeare. Tell you, Titus Andronicus. I, I, what a story that might you know that that brutality might appeal to the secret police kind of you know that kind of mentality. Wow, I it would. wow. That's yeah. horrible. A little taste of the of the language here. A little taste. Yeah, little that's taste. interesting. Yeah. Play on words. Yeah. Yeah, a little taste. Sorry let's eat the that. pie. Let's Ugh. eat the pie with tomorrow. Is uh, is it tomorrow with a T? Yeah. Tom- let's eat, let's eat the pie with the, you know of tomorrow's kids. God, wow. So Marcus says, "Alas, a crimson river of warm blood, like to a bubbling fountain strewed with wind." Doth rise and fall between thy rosed lips, coming and going with thy honey breath. And I believe he's speaking wow. here to tomorrow, but it's been a while. Wow. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm a you know, great admirer of Shakespeare, but I'm glad I missed that one, John. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you had to read that high school. You know, my, my high school uh, English class was, was a little more civilized. We read Macbeth, which is brutal enough. But yeah. that, that sounds like it's just, you know, uh, Mac, in terms of brutality, Macbeth sounds like it's just a prologue to Titus Andronicus. And, and this was just after Beowulf. <laughs> so we were on this oh, sort wow. of horror streak. Yeah, Beowulf was another brutal poem. But, you, but you're right. The bard's versatility. You can write these beautiful love sonnets and, and, a, and this heart-wrenching love story, Romeo and Juliet, like you said, and then, and then write this this brutal play where the was just filled filled with murderous violence and do it all at this exalted literary level his versatility is really stunning absolutely you know i, w- I wanted to say uh, uh something here about philosophy uh but there was is, was there something else you wanted to say about titus andronicus before we move on uh, i think i grossed people out enough <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody, but the uh, the hero show we pulled no punches, <laughs> you know. But uh, go back to Ben Johnson, uh, his 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 great, you know, the the, the way he lauded uh, and eulogized Shakespeare. You know, a famous line from Ben Johnson that that sh- that Shakespeare held up a mirror to life. Yeah, it was which goes back to your point before that you made, you know, nicely about what what Shakespeare's own philosophy. You know, it's, we, we, we could analyze that forever and probably never, never know for sure. But he held up a mirror to life. He, 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 showed, he showed human beings as they are, is, uh, is Ben Johnson's point. And he wasn't taking sides. He wasn't, um, he wasn't like the romantics. You know, he's, he's a naturalist in, in, in that regard. He's shown people as, as they are, and he's, he's not pushing a certain moral code as being the panacea for, for human ills. And the great romance, and there's different ways, you know, there's different ways, different approaches to literature and, and the way you can achieve literary stature. Because you look at the great romantics, Victor Hugo, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Ayn Rand, 
I, all of them are, they're promoting a certain vision. They, they, they have a certain vision of what human life might be and ought to be. Shakespeare is, I'm showing life as it is. The romantics are showing it as, you know, to paraphrase Aristotle, you know, as, as, it, as it might be and ought to be. I mean, Hugo has this you know, religious humanism, uh, this vision that, that, that appeals to God. I don't think Hugo is a Christian, not Les Miserables. Anyway, but there's a religious humanism that we, you know, we, we get the love of God and, and then we, 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 we're filled with the milk of human kindness, to quote Lady Macbeth. That's what the world needs. We could change the world, Hugo was telling us in Les Miserables, with benevolence, you know, with love. Love is all you need, right? So, so, said Lennon and McCartney. You could, we, could, we could change the world with love, of a, a, a divine love it has to come from God for our brothers and sisters. With Dostoevsky, very clearly, the Russian Orthodox Christian, he's promoting Christianity. You know, that man is a sinner, and we're all you know, doomed to, to damnation, and we need to, you know, we need to, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we need to adopt Christianity. And Christianity, if put into action, you know, can, can change human life for the better. And Ayn Rand, of course, in Atlas Shrugged, is developed a a whole new philosophy, a rational philosophy that she calls objectivism, and that if, if we if we fall in love with reason, in effect, and we and we understand what rationality is, and we live via rationality, then we could deal effectively with nature, you know, and create you know, all these uh, uh, products that you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the works of the mind that will improve human life, whether it's art, philosophy, uh, you know, and or technology, science and technology, and we could create all these products. You know, we learn how to. Uh, grow food and cure disease and everything, cure disease. And of course, that's how to deal, not just with nature, but with society. We, we reason out our differences, we, we ban the initiation of force, and this will transfigure human life. The, the great romantics, you're promoting a certain moral code, is, and, and, and they burn with passion to, to change human life for the better. That's part of their appeal. Well, Shakespeare, I think, is, a, is, is the great naturalist. This is the way it is. Take it or leave it, like it or lump it. This is the way human beings are, and he brings naturalism to the to the to the this exalted literary heights of you know of uh, in his in his in his dramas, and and he holds up a mirror to life. I think Ben Jonson is absolutely right. Whereas the great romantics, they uh, they're promoting a vision on how to improve human life. So I think I just want to make that make that point, but you know I, I think it's a, it's an important contrast. Uh, and it shows that, you know, you know, John, you and I prefer the romantic, you know, writers, uh, of course, but it shows naturalism is not necessarily a, uh, you know, a base, of form of, uh, of literature. You could, you could be a naturalist and raise it to great heights, you know, uh, uh, you know, of literary, literary form and literary expression. Nobody does that better than Shakespeare. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. I'd, I'd never thought of Shakespeare as a naturalist and you know, we tend to think of naturalists as the people that are just writing about what's literally right there directly in front of them and, and sort of giving these journalistic accounts. And, and Shakespeare doesn't fit that bill, but at a certain no. level, he's also just saying, well, well, this is how things are. Luckily, I don't think that is true of Titus Andronicus or perhaps <laughs> only in Bulgaria, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I doubt that that was I doubt that was uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's vision, but the tragedies are, the tragedies are bloody. But you know, but the the tragic flaw theory, you know, of inter of interpreting Shakespeare's tragedies that uh, the Achilles that, that, heel. Yeah, that you can have the the tra tragedy. Tragedy is the story of a, of a great man who who's destroyed by his own his own uh, flaws, his own, his, his own errors. Was that Aristotle in the Poetics? I can't remember who, who, where that definition comes from. But but, but the tra but regarding Shakespeare, the tragic flaw theory is you know it, it's plausible. You know that Hamlet is indecisive and Macbeth is a, too often described as ambitious. Uh, ambition, as Harry Binswanger pointed out to me nicely in this context, is a virtue. <laughs> Macbeth's a power luster, which is which is accurate. Lear is gullible and vain, and Othello is 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 jealous and. And these these all these are all towering figures, and they're, and they're all laid low. They're all destroyed. They're all dead by the end of by the end of the plays. Uh, just you know, harmed and, and undermined, and in, in the end killed by their own errors, their own you know their own moral weakness. You see a similar thing in some of the comedies. I recall from *A Midsummer Night's Dream* that uh, 
Oberon, the, the king of the fairies, wants to change how his wife feels about him. And, and so he orders one of his servants to get him this love ointment and put it on her, on her eyes. And she ends up falling with this guy who literally has a butt for a head. <laughs> and, and, you know, another, uh, the, the same servant, Puck, uh, a- attempts to interfere mm-hmm. in the affairs of some humans that are, have all these sorts of crazy love triangles and uh, messes that up pretty well before it finally figure, figures it out. And I think the, the message at the end is to, to use a line from, or a title actually, of another Shakespearean play, All's Well That Ends Well. But uh, there's definitely this, we get this message that those who try to, to interfere in things that aren't really their, their business uh, or try to do so in ways that aren't uh, legitimate end up hurting themselves more. Makes sense to me. And you know what? Uh, meddling in things that you have no business meddling in it reminds me of today of cancel culture, you know. So we're not going to teach Shakespeare in the schools for, for various reasons. There's a certain leftist mentality. We're not going to teach Shakespeare. Uh, why? Well, in The Merchant of Venice, there's some anti-Semitic, you know, elements. In, in The Taming of the Shrew, there's some elements, you know, that are degrading to women. Or the, or the, or the worst reason of all is that he's one of the dreaded dwems, you know, the DWEM is the, the dead white European males, which, which just makes literature all about race and gender and, 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 and time period. Now, this is just, in a word, this, is, this mentality is stupid, <laughs> not to mention bigoted, because the obvious, the obvious solution, I want to say something about the relevance of Shakespeare in our day, too, and the great, and the great Marva Collins, who we could do a hero show episode on because she was... Mm-hmm. She was certainly a, a heroine. But I think what should be an obvious response is tell the students, you know, the teachers, look, when we, when we, go, we go through with Merchant of Venice, there's, you know, Shylock is, is a stereotypical, you know, Jewish character, a stereotype, you know, that only cares about his money and blah, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he'll, you know, he'll, he'll you know, do anything, uh, harm, harm innocent people, do anything is to get money. So there's that, there's that element. So, you know, we, we, we acknowledge it, it's there, we, we, we deplore anti-Semitism and any form of racism, and now let's appreciate the greatness of, of, of Shakespeare's literary art. You know, uh, or similarly in, in, in The Taming of the Shrew or, or, or whatever it is. You know, we can acknowledge that there's, there's elements here that might be rationally offensive, might be bigoted in some ways. We, we, we censure that, we deplore it, but we admire Shakespeare's, you know, literary art tremendously. We don't throw out the baby with the bat, as, as, as they say. And the, the dead white European male you know, mentality. It's gone, come on. <laughs> it's literary, literary. When we analyze literature, we don't, we're not, we're, we're looking at the plot. We're looking at the depth of the theme. Is the theme integrated with the plot? We're looking at the characterizations. How much, you know, how much insight into the characters does, does, does the right, the writer have? Look at the beauty of the language. Uh, the, the gender of the writer doesn't matter. The time period doesn't matter. The race doesn't matter. So you know we have to. It's you know it's it's sad that we have to answer these kind of these kinds of irrational criticisms today. But but they need to be answered because you know Shakespeare not only in danger of being canceled in in some liter, literature curricula, he probably already has been in in, in some cases. Yeah, Heather McDonald. Um, what was her recent book called? I'm, I'm forgetting the title, but she actually talks about. Many of these great writers uh, actually are being taken out of literary or literature curriculums at colleges. So yeah, yeah, we're not going to read uh, *To Kill a Mockingbird*, which is a great novel, you know, by uh, Harper Lee. We're not going to read *To Kill a Mockingbird* because it has the white savior mentality. The white man who's you know is is uh, this this noble white man is trying to save this innocent black guy. That's the reason we're not going to read *To Kill a Mockingbird*. Uh, I mean. That's that's irrational. It's 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 a great novel, and it doesn't matter that the you know that the Atticus Finch is a is a noble white man. Actually, he's a noble person. That matters. What race 
you know, what racy is, is, is irrelevant. So yeah, we, we need to stand up for, you know, for the greatness of, for great literature uh, and great art generally against the, these people who think all that matters is race, gender, you know, or time period. And one, one last point on this, this idea that because Shakespeare is a dead white European male, he's not, he's not relevant today. I mean, that is just false. And you remember that great speech from Henry V that we, we ended with last week? That, that's an ode to courage. The same way, you know, in Cyrano de Bergerac, you know, when, when, Cyrano, when Cyrano's talking about, you know, I go my own way, I don't kowtow to the cardinal and everything. It's an ode to independence. Courage in, in the face of, of danger to your, to your life or your values, courage is, is universal. It's a universal theme. It's a universal value. It doesn't matter what time period you live in or what race or gender you are. Courage is a universal value. And that's, that's why I mentioned Marva Collins before. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, John, I know she had her kids reading Shakespeare you know, uh, at, at a very young age and, and understanding Shakespeare and appreciating Shakespeare when they were, you know, when they were, uh, when as much as, you know, young, you know, kids in elementary school can. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% accurate, but uh, sure of this, but I'm pretty sure she had the kids act it out, you know. And you could see kids, you know, and a lot of, a lot of those kids in the hood in Chicago, a lot of her students were black kids. Uh, there probably some white kids, some Latinos, some Asians. I think a lot of her students were, were black kids. You could see the, the, the boys in, in particular. I want to be Henry V. You know, <laughs> and I give the St. Crispin's Day speech. You know, I want I want to give that that great speech to that ode to courage. And so we're in Chicago with 1980 something, and Henry V is set in you know 14 something in in France. Doesn't matter. Courage is universal. So a dead white European male. That, that's just wrong. Yeah, his, he's relevant. These, these themes are timeless. You know, the issue of Hamlet, thinking too much, vacillating, not being decisive, doesn't matter what time or period this is. Uh, we, we might have all been at times in our life overthinking, overthinking a problem when I, when I know what I should do I, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm too afraid to do it or something, so I, I overthink it. You know, make a plan. And take the action, and that's really what you know. What Hamlet is uh, is showing us. It's timeless. Shakespeare. Shakespeare is not of an age, but for all time. Yeah. Answer, answer these people with Ben Johnson, John. We'll answer them with Ben Johnson. I'm sorry. I just went off on a rant. <laughs> well, it's uh, no. I mean, it, it's definitely relevant, and it's sad that you have to to make these points. But uh, you're you're absolutely right. Marva Collins, definitely a hero in my book. And uh, actually, I'm surprised we haven't already done. Haven't we? Haven't we done a show on Marva Collins? We did Maria Montessori. We haven't done oh, Marva Collins. Yeah. Okay. But we could do Marva Collins next week. I'm very Great happy. educator. To... Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, have another, I have another great speech from Henry V. I uh, thought you did. But... Um, I want to save this to the end, you know, end on this rousing stuff. So, you know, if, is there other things, other points about Shakespeare you want to make before we get to this, this speech? What else is there to say? <laughs> All right. Just kidding. No, I mean, we could talk about him forever. But yeah, we're, we're getting a bit long here. So, um, you know, if, if uh, we feel the necessity in the future, we can always come back. But I think we've done Shakespeare pretty good justice. Yes. Yes. And again, Henry V, uh, one, of, one of Shakespeare's histories, you know, it's, it, it, it's set during the Hundred Year War between England and France. And uh, here, here again, as in, in, that, in, in that great St. Crispin's Day speech that we read last week, Henry is rousing his troops for battle. And he says to his, to his men, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or we'll close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock o'erhang and, and 
Juddy, Juddy, his confounded bass, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fet from... F on, 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 you noblest English. Be copy now to men... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm messing this up. Let me go back here. On, on, you noblest English. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit and upon this charge cry, God for Harry England and St. George. Hmm. It's funny that <laughs> the, the thing that sticks out to me is uh, that I never realized the games of foot was from Shakespeare. Until right. just now, But I right. love that line, bend up the, their spirits to their full height. I don't think I got that perfectly, but I love right. that. Right, right. You know, I was thinking about that when I was, you know, rereading this last night, the game is afoot, of course. You and I are both great Sherlock Holmes fans, and, and Sherlock, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle puts those words in, 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 in Holmes' Holmes's mouth. But yeah, the, the, line, the line comes from Shakespeare, comes from, comes from Henry, Henry V. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some, some, again, some famous lines here. What is that about? But when the blast of war blows in our ears, you know, the, the, the blast of war... Uh, and look at some of the some of the imagery here. Let the brow o'erwhelm it, as fearfully as doth a galled rock or hang and juddy his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Wow, <laughs> what imagery! Yeah, you, know, you were talking about hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. So the uh, the part in here that I really like is. He's urging these guys, to man up. He said, dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, he's the, you got to, you know, you're not going to shave your mothers or fathers, are you guys? You know, get out there and fight like Englishmen. Cry havoc, right? Cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. Julius Caesar. Yeah, Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote this powerful martial, you know, poetry. And again, I think, you know, I think of it as it's a shame. It's all about warfare and bloodshed and people killing each other. But there's different there's different kinds of situations that call for courage. And this is universal. In this context, it's military courage in the face of death, you know, fighting, you know, fighting to the death. But there's all kinds of contexts that call for courage. And this, the, you know, the, the, those, these two poems, these two passages from Henry V, the one last week and the one this week, uh, really, really, uh, uh, I think, are odes to, to courage and, and could be, you know, very inspiring to us to, you know, to be like Shackleton, you know, take, take Shackleton's attitude that problems or dangers are, are, are just, you know, obstacles are just, you know, things to be overcome. And uh, courage, courage is a great virtue. And no, nobody, nobody, nobody wrote this inspiring poetry uh, to, to, you know, urging us to courage uh, the way Shakespeare did. Yes, I'll have to keep some of those lines in my back pocket. Yeah, I love the St. Crispin's Day speech most of all, but this one's very powerful too. You know, once more, oh, what was it? One, once more unto, unto the breach, dear friends, once more, this, you know, Powerful stuff. Was it? Was it? So I, I think John, uh, when we when we have this kind of powerful poetry here, the, you know, this this call for courage. I think we can conclude on that. We can salute the bard for his for his literary greatness. Say say thank you, uh, William Shakespeare. And on that note, 
I'd want to wish you to have a more heroic day, John. Everybody out there in Hero Land, have a more heroic day, heroic weekend, and, and a, a more heroic life. We'll see you next week again on The Hero Show. Thank <laughs> you.